All right. Hey, everyone. Uh, so we are starting this uh, new series wherein we are going to kind of take a look at the ARM A class of CPUs. And ARM A class, okay, let me just type here, ARM A class CPUs, uh, specifically the 64-bit variants, <coughs> which is also called the A Arch 64 uh, architecture. And the reason to that is these are like the most uh, common and heavyweight application processors uh, used in uh, M1 chip of Apple, uh, used in uh, almost all uh, phones, uh, right? And then there are also uh, laptop uh, chips that are coming up, which are based on uh, the ARM uh, A class uh, architecture, based on A class architecture. And uh, yeah, so I have caught hold of Mamad, who happens to know a lot about uh, this one specific class of processor. And uh, yeah, over to you, Mohammed. Do you want to yeah, guide us yeah. on how to go about learning this? Yeah, sure, sure. I would be happy yeah. to. You know, yeah. uh, I mean, yeah, I, here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Uh, anyway, I would want to add that they are also finding their ways in the desktop uh, processors, as you mentioned, but also on the data centers. Mm -hmm. So now there are so many companies which are, you know, sort of investigating whether ARM cores can be used in data centers in cloud. Mm -hmm. And this, this is going to be interesting. And with the mm -hmm. current uh, event in which Qualcomm sort of announced the X Elite architecture, mm -hmm. I would not say architecture, but the X Elite platform. Right. And they are essentially their effort is to make their own cores following mm -hmm. the ARM A class architecture. Right. So yeah something uh, very exciting and i think you know it's uh, this a class processor has a very bright future ahead right and then there was like recently in the microsoft's insight i think was it insight uh, insight they the also announced yeah, hmm. yeah an arm a based hmm. um uh, server chip i think it was yeah 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 right for their so we're Azure, yeah. Yes, for Azure. Yeah. Okay. So how do we go about uh, learning this? And also maybe before that, can we give uh, our audience kind of a hook into what A class CPU is at an architecture level? Hmm, maybe. Yeah. That sounds good. Yeah. So okay. I think uh, I uh, would like to start off with the diagram, which is like you know beaten to death when it comes to a class yeah. and i suppose it is cliched for a reason uh, yeah uh, because this is where you know we can start develop some mental model as mm -hmm. to how we should envision you know an a class processor right right and specifically again we are talking about the 64 bit. 64 bit yeah right 32 bit right uh, there's also that but we are talking about maybe mm. the v8 V8 and a 64. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. So and just a slight segue here. Uh, hmm. You know, people will also hear terms like V8 32-bit, which is also called ARCH32, mm -hmm. uh, right? Uh, so mostly, I think we are not going to cover that, uh, just because you know it's kind of there to mm -hmm. preserve the backward compatibility. Correct. Correct. So when ARM is... came up with mm -hmm. V8 architecture, they also needed to find a way hmm. so that the older software which used to run on v7 can still run and you would right. be uh, surprised to know that that is a big concern when it comes to you know uh, changing your architecture you have to right. make sure that it is backward compatible compatible with the older versions right so, and then uh, in, the v8 architecture i suppose came in like 2011 mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. 2011 to 12, I think three years after the you know release of Gangnam Style. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. Okay. So, okay. Uh, Fair. So, what are we looking at here? So, yeah. Maybe walk uh, us through. Mm -hmm, yeah. So here you would see you know basically a lot of boxes with the different levels, right? And uh, I, I let's focus our attention on what are these levels. Mm -hmm. So, uh, if you recall, mm -hmm. uh, you know in v7 if you know our audience is aware uh, it doesn't matter if you are not you know mm -hmm. uh, in v7 there were modes 
there were like seven modes user mode mm-hmm. supervisor mode irq mode mm-hmm. stuff mm-hmm. like that mm-hmm. and this this sort of you know kind of with every mode give you some feature uh, mm-hmm. some privilege like mm-hmm. hey you can do some things if you are in some mm-hmm. mode but not mm-hmm. everything if you are in some other mode mm-hmm. so i think the same extension goes here it's a mm-hmm. kind of a, a mapping from modes mm-hmm. to privilege levels in v8 right mm-hmm. maybe can we can we uh, or rather let me just you know add some information as to what modes and privileges are mm-hmm. how to think about it so what happens usually is that an application class processor has like a lot of obviously a lot of capabilities and a lot of circuits what we would want it to do is turn off different circuits or turn off different instructions so to speak yeah. when it is at a different level so the idea of these you know exception levels here or modes and privileges is that your cpu can execute certain instructions right if it is not so let's say maybe we will come to this like in mm-hmm. more details but just going ahead jumping the gun here so if you have an application running for example you wouldn't want it to execute instructions that can fetch let's say the exception related details right yeah yeah mm-hmm. or you wouldn't want it to do something which is uh, handle interrupts for example handle right? interrupts right yes so so what what you are then saying is that in when when the cpu is in hardware switched to certain mode or certain privilege level or certain exception level in mm-hmm. this case certain parts of the instructions because not certain parts but certain instructions so, become, become unavailable. unaccessible yeah okay. certain instructions become unavailable or certain registers become unaccessible yes. and stuff like that yes. so it's basically yes. you know sort of guarding against mm-hmm. something and yes. uh, let's maybe you know ask ourselves why it was needed right because if you look okay. at you know older architectures early mm-hmm. 2000s we did not have mm-hmm. this and okay. the reason well i you know the answer with you know with which i have made peace, peace. with myself is mm-hmm. uh, that in in earlier days you know the the chip maker used to completely own the code as well right uh-huh. so they okay. would ship the chip they would ship the code that would run in a product and you are done basically there is mm. no need to change the code there is no need to run a code which is you know not written by you it's a third party code right so there basically because the code is coming from the vendor ah uh, sorry the chip maker there mm. was complete trust that that mm. uh, software is not being something malicious right now given in you know when the use cases of the chip of the processors kind of advanced you wanted mm-hmm. you know to run more and more apps to mm-hmm. run more and more use cases what happened was uh you were actually looking to run code which is not developed by the chip maker right right the the apps which we download from play store and mm-hmm. no one no one knows what's inside what mm-hmm. code is running what it is trying to do so mm-hmm. you need something some facility in hardware which can prevent that code to also break your system your mm. your os your mm. kernel what right mm. and that kind of drove the architecture designers to also provide such facilities in hardware right and right now when we look at the architecture let's say someone who is new starting can if they look at the architecture spec ar64 mm-hmm. this diagram it may look complex <laughs> And it is complex by by no means it is not I mean, but then yeah. with <laughs> but then with the history behind it i think once we know why it was why it is the way it is i think right. it can give us some confidence into you know uh, learning about it it's like right hey, I, and hmm. yes and you know there is like a very logical way to think about yeah, these yeah exactly right yeah okay then maybe let's hmm. let's uh, let me maybe just quickly reiterate Uh, why there was a separation mm-hmm. required so you mentioned that earlier in 2000s the chip manufacturer owned the code running on the code also uh, on the core also yeah right and then there came a time where they had to give some part of the code right mm-hmm. let's say some kernel or some some you know code. so as mm-hmm. our use cases became more generic mm-hmm. uh, obviously uh, one organization cannot do everything 
Hmm. So you needed to have some platform which can host other code, which is not right. owned by that company, which is not hmm. owned by that organization, but still hmm. should run as intended. Hmm. Okay. And then the idea is that the manufacturer has some code on the chip just right. for bookkeeping man, you know, management and all of management that. Management and right. making sure that no matter however, well, there are some security vulnerabilities, but apart from that, no matter how much uh, nuisance the third party app wants to create, it mm. doesn't have a chance, basically. All right. All right. So essentially, then the customer can write hmm. this third party app. Yeah. We, we are calling it third party, but hmm. essentially customer app potentially. Yeah. And we are wanting to then say hmm. that, hey, you know, the management related tasks will be done hmm. by this code and only the computation or, you know, the application right. related right. part is done and done by this code. And this code should not be able to go fiddle with the right. hard, exactly. hardware and screw up the configuration. Right. Right. That's the idea. Okay. So okay. basically sandboxing everything hmm. as much as hmm. you can. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I think sandboxing is a good idea. Hmm. And with that, I suppose when we talk about, you know, this diagram, things will right. make a lot more sense. Yeah. 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 Okay. Go ahead. So, okay. Now jumping into the diagram on the uh, right hand side. So as you see, there are like multiple levels, EL0, EL1 up to EL3. Uh, mm -hmm. And the key insight here is as you go from top to bottom, the privilege increases. Mm -hmm. So if you're, let's say your software or your code is running in EL3, then it has basically open access to everything. Entire mm -hmm. system is at your disposal. You can mm -hmm. touch any register. You can access anything. You can fiddle mm -hmm. around uh, however you want. Okay. Okay. And that is one uh, privilege increases, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I should say the latency to access something also decreases. Now, uh, this may not make much sense at this point, but uh, mm -hmm. yeah, this is something which, you know we can re uh, mm -hmm. remember. At this, uh, we'll come to this, you know, in great detail. Right. So, just a sneak peek. Latency would maybe you know, uh, let's say, latency to access some hardware memory, block. some mm -hmm. hardware block, some memory mm -hmm. region, mm -hmm. right? Because each of this level will have its own address translations and so many other things, you can see right. if uh, uh, you are accessing the same block from EL0, it would generally take more time than hmm. when you access that the same block from EL3. Right. Uh, so yeah, uh, recapping, uh, the privilege increases from top to bottom, latency decreases as you go from top to bottom. Right. Okay. And all right. And we'll we'll uh, take a look at what each level does. But on the mm. other hand, if you see, there is another arrow vertically which separates two worlds, sort of. Mm. Right. Uh, yes. So with ARM v8, uh, they kind of introduce this concept of normal world and secure world. So again, right. all of almost you know everything is kind of copied over to secure world as well. But mm -hmm. there is one piece missing, uh, which is uh, the EL2, which was not part of, you know, ARM V8A architecture. Okay. Uh, but, okay, I'll let the noise die down. Uh, sorry for the viewers. I think uh, there, are, there, are there are some, some fireworks going yes. on. Yeah. Okay. Celebrations. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Are they celebrating, you know, us making this video? Uh, oh, who knows? Or, Maybe. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, uh, okay, coming back. <laughs> so with ARM v9, they also introduced this missing piece, which was, you know, secure EL2. Right. This came with v9, yeah. Right. One of the extensions. Right. I think it was there but, as... Mm -hmm. Go ahead, go ahead, complete your... Uh, it was there as one of the extensions also in v8, I but uh, yeah, it was enabled. From Okay, right. so maybe can we talk about you know yeah. what's happening here? Right, right. What runs where? Exactly. So now, now that you know, we have done. Okay. <laughs> I'll I'll mute myself. Go ahead. So because uh, sorry, uh, where was I? Yeah, we have now covered you know the levels sort of briefly. Now let's go and see what all is running at what level and why they are there basically, right? So if we Start from the EL0, 
here you would see you know what is uh, traditionally known as user space code so that is where you know all the applications uh, run so if you say hey my android app it runs mostly in uh, el0 uh, right and if you are let's say running a linux kernel then whatever process you create out of it it runs in user space el0 right uh, so for example if you let's say run your cat command or find command that would run here it would be created as a process and it would run here and this is where all these like, sort of light blue boxes indicate that each has its own kind of process sandbox into a process and each of that process is running uh, separately in el0 right okay. now i will go into a lot more detail you know and what constitutes a process you know and how to think of that view that in from a software programmer's point of view and stuff like that but for now just remember that uh, each of the process runs in el0 and it's sort of sandboxed into its own little environment okay and now if you go a level below then we have el1 so el1 is the kernel is the os which hosts all the processes right and here you would see hey why why the hell there are two uh, guest oss and that is because this architecture allows you to have multiple kernels multiple oss essentially running in the same core same system each not knowing about the existence of the other so it's completely independent of each other and for most of the mobile applications we only have one kernel running but this is there and this is the reason why you know arm architectures are finding a place in uh, server chips as well because in server you require multiple vms to run or to be hosted on the same chip right all right uh, moving ahead uh, so yeah the el1 is where your kernel code would be running right uh, and uh, point to remember is there can be more than one kernel uh, running on the same chip as well most of the times it won't happen but yeah there is a possibility then that that it can now okay now el2 comes in play if let's say there were multiple kernels actually running right so just like uh, think of this in terms of you know how a process or juggling between different processes uh, context switching between different processes require some code which can do that which can schedule which can context switch and that is traditionally our kernel code right and in in, in our model we have like multiple kernels here so we would need some code which can juggle between different kernels and this is where your el2 code or which is known as hypervisor comes in play so what hypervisor would do is it will juggle between different kernels and without the kernels knowing that they have been context switch so just like you can basically extend the same analogy of process and kernel to kernel and hypervisor essentially doing the same thing okay and now okay i know it's it's complex the already way, yeah mohammed i have a point to add yeah, yeah, so yeah. what people can imagine is the way a kernel can schedule tasks and applications and give a perception of you know multiple programs running at once the hypervisor on the same cpu hmm. can run two operating systems essentially they not knowing of each other it will context switch between two operating systems which are then in turning in turn you know context switching between applications yeah. Yeah. and this actually forms the basis of the cloud computing right right you you have like a server chip and on the server chip you have a virtual machine instance that you have given out to one user and then another virtual machine instance that you have given out to you know some yeah. other uh, user so okay go go ahead Mohan. yeah yeah and in fact you know i would if uh, if we can maybe add more to the cloud computing analogy so here a natural question would be like hey uh, let's say you know you are hosting your website on some server right and i am hosting on website piyush is also hosting on website and theoretically they can 
those apache servers or whatever stack they are using can run as own process we don't need vms a single os can do the job right why don't we use that that's a natural question to ask single os uh, which will you know context switch between different websites right it, it is possible but we do not want that because some attack some ddos attack on my website can also prevent piyush's website from being accessible right because they are essentially running in a same kernel on a same kernel so on cloud it becomes like inevitable that you have your own kernel as well that is called vm and otherwise you know you are basically losing on a lot of security you are basically giving away foregoing a lot of security and when this is there like each kernel has you know let's say piyush's website is running on kernel 1 and mine on kernel 2 that kind of sandbox it sandbox it very nicely but you because it's cloud you want as to them to run on a, sim, a single system a single uh, physical system and you need some juggler you need some some entity which can context switch between the entire vms and this is where your hypervisor comes in play uh we should want to add anything here No, I think you pretty much covered okay. that. So that's that's the point. Now, now in this case, if let's say Mohammed's server or website got down. attacked, yeah. yeah. So this much part is completely mm -hmm. ruined, but my my website and services are like still secure. Right. Right. Also, you know, uh, people should note this that I can get separate login details and Mohammed mm -hmm. can get separate login yeah. details because the operating systems are yeah. separate so instead of creating multiple users in the same kernel you are essentially mm -hmm. creating the same kernel mm -hmm. and this is where you know you sort of uh, uh isolate with you know attacks like privilege escalation you know re yeah. remote code execution so yeah. even if it does something malicious it would be only pertaining to the vm it was uh, part out. of Yeah, right. And by the way, we are we are referring this entire stack as the VM, the virtual mm, machine. Virtual machine. Right. And the the hypervisor, so to speak, is also called the virtual machine manager. Right. Mm -hmm. So it gives an illusion that you have a machine and I have a machine, and it's kind of you know going between the two, but we are not getting to know that. Now it also makes business sense, by the way. Right. So let's say uh, somebody can argue, hey, why not give a separate physical machine to mm, Piyush and yeah. se separate physical machine to Mohammed? Let's say Mohammed decided to, you know, move migrate over to some other service, some other provider. Then this machine is, you know, idle. Nobody is using it, and also the configuration is fixed. Right. Configuration is fixed, meaning the CPU count is fixed, the memory is fixed, and all and so on right. and so forth. Right. what the hypervisor can do is if you have the cpu with let's say i don't know 72 cores for example it can decide on how many cores will mohammed's stack run and on how many core piyush's stack will run hmm. and so you know if you have used aws or gcp azure uh, you can configure the number of uh, cpus and what that really means right. is uh, azure or you know uh, aws or gcp will let the hypervisor know how many cpus to dedicate to you on a given chip yeah but this of course you know all of this is just like complete overkill to <laughs> convince you of the hypervisor <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, layer and why it's needed okay maybe we can we can move on yeah, yeah. yeah. plus just sorry i am again going back just one minor point it also if you have like separate physical machines for uh, separate websites let's say in our example that's like completely inefficient use of that right so for example your website is not at all you know my website is very dull it's not handling as many requests but you are still sort of occupying that machine just to solve that so obviously it made business and natural sense to sort of you know virtualize everything and if you virtualizing if you're adding one more layer and that layer is the hypervisor so yeah, yeah we just wanted to drive that one point home uh, okay right and <laughs> okay. so i i'll just read it yeah. just so that if our audience is lost they can you know catch up again mm -hmm. which is el0 are applications el1 are operating systems 
and EL2 is hypervisor. The hypervisor juggles between the operating system. Each of the operating system juggles between different applications running on it, right? And now with this, we are down to oh, what EL3 is. Go ahead. Okay. And yeah, and please, you know, bear with us, uh, folks, because we are going to introduce one more layer, which is going to juggle between something. It is going to juggle between the worlds which we, are, which we, you know, briefly talked about. Yeah. So this is normal world. This is secure world. And you are like, okay, why, why the hell is this even required? And and you see how you know each layer adds so much complexity because each layer has to do its job of juggling, but has to do it in a way where you know the other layers above are completely oblivious to it. And and, and it's just it's just mind boggling here at this point but yeah so here we have at el3 that is the last layer we have introduced one more layer uh, one more layer meaning one more piece of code which is running at that level which is now juggling between multiple hypervisors or multiple worlds not just hypervisor no. here at this yeah. point. by the way uh, i should mention multiple mm -hmm. hypervisors mm -hmm. may not exist yeah uh, no I, do, I don't know if you know if people want to make it can multiple meaning one? i think it can exist if let's say we have v9 and you know there is an ah, okay. el2 Sec and secure yeah, side okay. as well okay, okay. Fair, fair, but fair. uh for i think in this uh because we are concerning ourselves with v8 mm. multiple hypervisors actually i don't i cannot yeah, imagine any use case uh, where for, you know you would yeah. need multiple hypervisors uh so yeah okay so now i i just want to you know uh, give some reason as to convince you folks as to why we have you know uh, this separation between normal world and secure world so uh, let's uh, i think i can think of one example so let's go to you know the phone world uh, where you know um, with android there are some apps which come which are first party apps now what are first party apps is that uh, they are part of android and there is full trust that hey this app is doing what it needs to do and i trust it you know completely uh, so one of the examples could be you know the process or app which is running to recognize your fingerprint right uh, and you see how how important that is uh, you want this app to run in complete isolation as much isolation as possible right where no other process running can in any way or form touch it or play or fiddle around with. Right. Uh, so so I, I just want to extend that mm -hmm. a little bit, which is imagine if one of the applications got compromised and somehow the operating system mm -hmm. got compromised. And if your fingerprint, you know, access to that sensor and the local image or local show of the fingerprint, if the operating system had access to it, uh, your fingerprint is compromised yeah. you don't want that so the question is uh, how do we you know avoid the fingerprint from getting stolen and not only fingerprint mm. there are other sensitive information like yeah. credit card details the key uh, ring the basically of, right yeah key mm. ring mm. Uh, key ring and uh, your face authentication those kind of things mm. yeah Go, yeah. go ahead uh, right right i think you uh, uh, this is very precise so if let's say you're one of the guest OS gets now because you know in in a model where we did not have secure world we just had one world uh, for, uh, maybe Pish, can you scratch it uh, for now we just had like this world yeah we did not have a secure world so uh, your fingerprint app or process has to be part of some some VM right some guest OS even though let's say our idea is hey we'll have some multiple guest OSs but will that fingerprint app has to be part of that guest OS. And if that guest, any other app running on that guest OS gets compromised, you're basically, you know, given a track to sort of fetch the data of the fingerprint app, which is, you know, very important. And in order to prevent such scenarios, what you're essentially doing is, hey, I will have like, you know, another environment, which is completely isolated to the left side, and this is where ARM introduced, you know, a secure world. It's a completely different world. Right. Uh, 
and also mm -hmm. maybe let me let me draw a tiny little diagram here to bring kind of hit the point home so you have you know memory this is like all of this is one memory yeah and you have the fingerprint sensor right fingerprint sensor so earlier we were saying that you know access to the hardware or instruction set that gets limited based on which el you are in mm. right so el essentially restricts uh, isa or instruction set operations and the secure non-secure access uh, limits your hardware access so let's say you have your cpu and it's wanting to go to the memory mm. now some part of this memory uh, will not be available if you are executing in normal world right yeah. similarly there are many hardwares that you can have usb pcie some audio something right and then similarly some hardwares like the peripheral uh, sorry fingerprint sensor the access to that will not be available if you are in normal mm -hmm. you only have access to these memory and this fingerprint sensor if you are in the secure world and the secure world formally is called trust zone trust uh, trust zone right so we say that this memory is marked as trust zone and this fingerprint scanner is marked as trust zone uh, Mohammed, do, do you mind if I go ahead and talk about how the fingerprint authentication may yeah, happen? May happen. Oh. Yeah, why not? Right. So one of the ways in which, um, so uh, let's say you have an application here. Let's say you know WhatsApp, right? Uh, let's say WhatsApp and WhatsApp. You have like you know the fingerprint uh, locking on it. So you want to open that application, and now all of a sudden is ask for authentication. <laughs> So the application sends a request to the operating system saying, hey, I want you to authenticate the user. Check if it, if the user trying to open this app is the same user to whom the phone belongs. The guest OS says, hey, you know what? I have no idea how to do that. I'm going to talk to the person here. I mean, talk to either the person here or here, depending on whether or not hypervisor is present. The, the secure monitor here, some code will be running here. And that code essentially then says, hey, you know what? I am the secure. Oh, by the way, I sh we should have mentioned it, that the partitioning is like this. Mm -hmm. So all of all of this is secure code. So this guy says, hey, you know what? I, I, do, I do not know how to you know, authenticate. But let me check if somebody in the secure world knows it. Uh, Piyush, uh, want to add one point? Mm -hmm. So that secure monitor has access to everything in blue. Yes. Uh, Yes. the the blue diagram on the left hand side oh, okay correct, correct yeah so correct. it has access to the trust zone memory the secure memory yes. the hardware yes. sensor but yes. that monitor would not have the code to actually go and verify the fingerprint yes so this guy will have some hooks mm -hmm. and in that hooks the the trusted software here the trusted operating system mm -hmm. that would have provided some uh, kind handlers. of registered some handlers, handlers saying if you need authentication service you know let me know mm -hmm. only that much yeah and so the call goes up here now notice that this is the secure world mm -hmm. and then here again this guy will say hey you know somebody above me told mm -hmm. me that they can do authentication mm -hmm. so i have registered this hook with you yeah and then this trusted os will call a small app which is trusted app and say hey you know we want to authenticate. So this from this region, there would be the sensor activation that happens. Okay, let me change the color here, or actually let me go in. Yes. So from here, the CPU now can send request to the or reach out to the fingerprint sensor, you know, get the fingerprint, let's say, image, and then reach out to the secure memory, find out the image here, mm. compare both of them. Right. And now what will happen is the answer of that authentication is returned backwards, like down from secure world all the way. So this guy will only return a zero or one mm -hmm. saying it's either the user or it's not the user. Then this trusted OS will pass that zero or one information down here. And then this guy will propagate it up here, zero or one. And then this guy will propagate it to the application. And now if the, you know, authentication went through and the answer was one, then WhatsApp opens. If the answer was zero, WhatsApp stays locked. 
Now, what has happened is even if you compromise the application or the OS, right? Uh, the fingerprint data is not stolen. The data is not stolen and you cannot even reach the fingerprint mm. scanner, which then means that the app will never be able to look at the image of your thumbprint, Yeah, which is yeah. what you want. Exactly. And this is just one of the examples. Uh, I'll give another example or just bring people's attention. So if you're watching Amazon Prime, right, or Netflix, and if you take a screenshot, you get a black color image like complete black image. And the reason to that is uh, that, you know, the the streaming is ongoing from secure channels. And when you take a screenshot, that screenshot is taken from non-secure. The screenshot app is running In on the, non-secure. Yeah, non-secure. And, yeah. and it cannot reach out to, so to speak, the video buffer right. where, you know, your uh, image is being, or rather mm. the video data is being put. Yeah. So instead, it just gives like all blacks and then you get all blacks. So that's like, you know, uh, data protection right. uh, strategies. Mm -hmm. And obviously then, you know, some part of, again, I'm not super sure, but some part of Amazon Prime run here, some part of Netflix runs here. Signal for uh, example. In fact, uh, you know, they, as, mm -hmm. uh, I read somewhere that they actually have drawn away from the app model. So they have their own VM. Oh, uh, okay. And <laughs> okay. And now that, you know, with the hypervisor being enabled in V9, but okay, that's yeah. uh, so it's like they have a complete stack here, stack. So I suppose all of this is happening just because you're saying, I don't trust the environment trust, exactly. uh, that is given to right. me. Right. 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 Okay, okay. Perfect. And so, thanks, Piyush. I think this, uh, you really drove yeah. the point home. Point home, uh, yeah. <laughs> and this, you know, uh, because, uh, uh, sorry, people, you know, if I, you'd find that I segue a lot and, and more or less, I want to, you know, justify why we are doing it, you know, yeah. otherwise I can't move. It is just how I am. And mm -hmm. here one option is, uh, if you know, folks were, uh, uh, thinking about it instead of running the code there, you know, going all the way to secure firmware, uh, where our fingerprint code was running, right. We could have run the same code at EL3 because EL3 has the same access. That could have worked, but why, why are we not doing this is because it does not make that model extensible. Generally what happens is that EL3 code, whatever the, whatever firmware that runs in EL3 comes from the vendor, the mobile manufacturer, so to speak. And they cannot, they basically, they cannot accommodate all the code, which wants to run in secure world, right? They have to provide some platform just like, you know, we provided the platform in the normal world. We have to provide a platform which runs in a uh, secure world, even though they come with their own baggage of latency, but uh, you know, it is the only way to make it extensible. So, and that is why, you know, let's say, uh, as Piyush mentioned, right? Amazon prime, uh, decided they, they want, they want to prevent users from taking screenshot. Netflix decided it. Some, uh, you can all, you can make your own app, which decides that, Hey, I don't want to allow this thing. And I want to run in secure world. I think that uh, you have to, you know, take, there is some, uh, not every app can be run in secure world. You have to have some, uh, there is some formal process, but theoretically it is possible. So yeah, maybe, you know, I'll, I'll speak to that a little mm -hmm. more, which is, uh, remember there is an OS running here also. Yeah. The trusted OS. And this is not as much feature rich. Right. And by feature, we mean services. It doesn't mm -hmm. have as many services. So typically then you do something which is as minimal as possible. For example, fingerprint authentication, you know, face authentication, uh, getting the credit card information or storing passwords, those kind of stuff. Uh, those are the kind of services you deploy as mm -hmm. small, small apps. Uh, again, this is just FYI, not that everybody will, uh, you know, end up doing this. Uh, but I suppose our intention was to call out that, you know, the whole A Arch 64 is a complicated machine for a reason. Yeah. Right? yeah. And we are going to peel away the onion and explore all the, you know, levels and regions maybe also do experiments hmm. and show in code. Uh, also, maybe, uh, Mohamed, would you say that we have pretty much given a good idea, like a cliffhanger for what's coming? Yeah, I think so. I think maybe so. we should now explore how we plan on 
uh, you know, exploring the AI architecture mm -hmm. and then also the documentation that people can refer right, to. Right, right, right. Makes sense. Okay. And this all, you know, everything, every layer which we talked about, uh, the worlds is running on your palm. Easy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Crazy. It's like a thumb it's crazy size chip. Of, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you all know, the right. entire flow which we explained, right, of the fingerprint yeah. was is is happening every time you unlock a screen. Is that every, yeah. happening every time you want to, you know, do a transaction, transaction, maybe UPI transaction yeah. or something like that? Yeah. Good. Okay. Do we want to then jump back to our previous whiteboard and talk about right, how we yeah, plan yeah. on covering? Uh, so I think uh, at this point we can, you know, maybe uh, come up with a mind map or a, a model and mm -hmm. we'll just, you know, kind of lay out the terms, mm -hmm. which uh, anyone who is starting or, you know, wanting to mo know more about uh, AR64 mm -hmm. uh, should keep in mind. Because these are the terms, you know, which uh, will come across uh, repeatedly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so maybe, you know, um, uh, so we have like a core, uh, AR64 core. And in order to know, okay, um, you need to sharpen the pen. Maybe. Yeah, somehow I'm uh, not able to, you know, uh, draw. Hmm. <laughs> so I'll sharpen my pen. Okay, 2.5 maybe. Okay. More than I think, it's like a modern <laughs> sharpener. Basically. Yeah. Okay. So what? Oh man. Um, it might also be that my machine is starting to f fail Lag. because mm -hmm. yeah, because a lot of things are running. Um, let me close few windows. Sure. Let's see. Maybe that will help. You know, we need to upgrade our hardware, <laughs> but then we are short of money. So yeah. Okay. It's really hanging. <laughs> Is it too jittery? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's see. Let's see. What can I do about it? Okay. Let Let's do this. Let's uh, ditch this and uh, jump to I suppose another. Hmm. Yeah. Very or maybe nice. you can close the. Yeah, I close that window, okay. and this one's like one of the documents, but I found some white space. <laughs> So, okay, oh, what's our, okay, okay, this yeah, is nice. Cool, what's cool. our plan? So, yeah. uh, I would want to list out, you know, all the terms uh, which mm -hmm. uh, people would come across when they start a, a arm. Okay, and... I'll, yeah, and I'll me let me just, mm -hmm. you know, draw the nice. So, this was EL0. Yes, people should brain tattoo this if they want to, you know, uh, is invest that a, into... Is that a term? Okay, brain, brain tattoo. tattoo. Yeah, okay. <laughs> heard it somewhere. Okay, okay. non-secure or normal world, and this is the secure, secure. world, and uh, this is you know all the CPU, and then the CPU has you know few buses that mm -hmm. are going out, and then it has interrupts, and yeah. um, we'll talk about this more. But there is something called IRQ and FIQ, which is the interrupt and mm -hmm. fast interrupt, yeah. right? And then there are buses to access the uh, memory. Right. And there is also a debug bus, right? So hmm. based on this diagram now, uh, let's go yeah. ahead. So we'll like, you know, um, hear these many terms. So whenever we start a new architecture, right? AR64 in our case. So you would find few accompanying, you know, docs, which will link in the description. But uh, you'll also hear these terms where, you know, you would have, hey, let's uh, go look about what the program and model of that architecture is. So yeah, you would hear programmer's model and that sort of is divided into uh, three things okay one is the uh, i think interrupt and exception model okay i think uh, my mom was here <laughs> oh okay go ahead cool uh, so uh, yeah so Programmer's model is sort of divided into three things. One is interrupt and exception model. Yeah, exception model, yeah. Then you have memory model. So exception model will tell us as to how to think about IRQs and FIQs, right? And, you know, what happens when a core takes an exception. So we'll talk about a lot uh, in detail about this in future. 
and then you have debug infra basically the debug entries infra how to go on about programming that obtaining debug info and such uh what else the peripherals definitely uh, but the programmers model also talks about I, isa yeah, you can, and you know some special instructions registers and yeah registers and special instructions yeah okay so mm -hmm. this was mostly you know the core specific stuff and you would find that an a core on its own is kind of useless so it has to have it's not like you know an m class controller where the core itself contains everything so for a class uh, you require you know peripherals to go along with that in order to actually achieve some some use case right so in peripheral the the important one is mmu the memory management unit uh, it's crazy uh, you know each state each level has its own mmu you know own page tables and stuff and it's it's uh, uh, a very interesting to know about that uh, then other peripheral would be gig uh, uh, that area might uh, you know, be covered by a oh, no. yeah okay right. so i'll okay. <laughs> move it up here yes and we have free space here no we have i think it's fine it'll, maybe you know we'll write in uh, yeah we'll we'll erase the yeah. stuff on erase top this, yeah uh gig what else uh we have timers timers uh, yeah, yeah yeah timers i think these are like and you know also cache. synchronization yeah caches synchronization caches. primitives you know barriers and stuff yeah i think these are these are kind of uh, hmm. enough i would say yeah. uh, from the standpoint that you know if you know mmu if you happen to know gig hmm. if you happen to know timer and hmm. caches you can pretty much get the score to do like uh, you know implement yeah. an application on it yeah. right by the way i should also mention when we plan or when we mention that we'll cover the CPU using the demos, uh, it would be like we write code for all the layers. Mm -hmm. That's <laughs> right. the plan. So yeah, that's and the plan. It's our plan not is like... to run on a Raspberry Pi. Uh... Yeah, or something else if we find better, mm -hmm. but mostly Raspberry Pi, and we will boot it from scratch. <laughs> uh, right, we'll go from EL three having our code here to having some code here to EL one and EL zero. This is going to be a long playlist. Uh, yeah. maybe months and years who knows but uh, intention is to kind of just unpack the a class cpu and do everything from scratch yeah and believe me this is going to be cool you know once yeah. uh, you see it in action you will feel like hey you know it's it was worth it so yes it really worth true it. true yes cool uh, so uh, and, maybe i think hmm. i want to touch base on fabric as well like because okay. you know a class um, like, let's Sure, let's call it interconnect. Interconnect, yeah. On network or interconnect. Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm writing in the wrong place. Inter. You can maybe uh, wrap this out and. Yeah. You know, my I think my machine is starting to give yeah. up. We need to <laughs> upgrade, <laughs> but we don't have money. Please donate. <laughs> <laughs> Was that but a do shameless plug? <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's like, please consider okay. becoming a member or okay. helping us yeah. if you can. Yeah. You don't have to, but if you can, yeah. uh, we'll be forever grateful. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, what were we saying? What ah, were we talking interconnects. About? Oh, I was thinking money. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! Oh man! Inter, inter. But it is really starting to. You know, yeah. You know, would it help if we just you know sort of dictate and no need to draw? Yeah. Okay. I think that's okay yeah. too. Do Do we or do Do we maybe want to take up? Maybe finish your thought on interconnect yeah. and then you interconnect. Know, you know, there. we had like you know, you'd see they are basically divided into two groups where mm -hmm. you want to maintain coherency. Other ones are you don't. So coherent interconnects and non-coherent interconnects. Uh, we'll okay. I think uh, let's leave it at that too. Money. <laughs> ah, man. Uh, anyway, uh, yeah. So, so go hmm. ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just. Uh, Basically, this uh, coherent interconnects have you know AXI, ACE, ACE light. All of those terms, you know, you will hear in one form or the other, or it, you know, whenever we are deep diving. I just wanted the goal here was to sort of you know form a memory uh, mind map of how they are related and 
we would uh, like to basically touch base on all of them in, in, in right. near future. Right. Essentially, you know, as many of the IPs that yeah. ARM provides and has the documentation yeah. public, so we would want to kind of expose and give away how to understand the yeah. documentation. Right? And our, of course, reference platform is Raspberry Pi, so we mm. can you know discuss based on that. Yeah. Uh, cool. Mohamed, I'm thinking maybe let's jump on to the documents, briefly show the documents that you know right. people can refer Which, yeah, to. Yeah. Obviously, we would have linked them uh, in the description, uh, but I kind of just want to touch base on that. Yeah, sure. So let me then, you know, get rid of, uh, actually, let me just share. The... I think one is already open, the one where we're drawing. Uh, the PDF, yes, but I want to show the web pages okay. so that people know what to right. do. Right. So let me go ahead and share a window. Which window? This one. Yes. Man, this is so tricky. <laughs> Juggling between all the windows, but we have managed. Okay, so then. You are, so you are a hypervisor. Yes, I'm, a current, eh, juggling I don't know. Windows. Okay, okay. Windows, the operating system. Yeah. Man. Okay, okay. Cool, cool. Okay. Good, good joke. So, uh, you know, what document is this? Uh, so, this is okay. Maybe you can, can you open one of the other tabs? Uh, yeah, third tab. Yeah, this one. So, this is the architecture reference manual. And I actually I wanted to cover, you know, what is what. Let's, but let's go we'll into that go into later. Next yeah. video. Yeah. yeah. Because so I what can't is draw the, now. <laughs> so why do we have these many documents? You know, what info is contained where? We'll all hmm. answer it in, you know, uh, next video. Yeah. But uh, here, basically, this is the Bible, so to speak, the ARM. Uh, it's a pun on ARM's name, Architecture Reference Menu. And if you see, this is like, I think, uh, some 10K page long, which contains like, you know, it's jam-packed with info. 12 yeah, so 12K. 13k in fact yeah yeah so close to 13k mm, short, so of short of 60 pages <laughs> by the way i should mention that you see like six tabs here yeah. our documents are only three in number mm -hmm. but these are like the html versions mm -hmm. uh, and then download. these are like the PDF downloaded versions. pdfs yeah. yeah and as you can see the arm doesn't even open mm -hmm. <laughs> right so at least my machine is giving up on yeah. many things today Okay, so this is jam packed with info, you know, on how the A core should behave, right? Yeah, uh, and it's so jam packed that they decided to not have a HTML version, but just uh, have uh, the a PDF yeah. downloadable version. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is true. The AR whatever info you will find in ARM is true for all the A class cores. Any core you find out there will follow or should adhere to this, you know, uh, this ARM, right? And yeah. now things like, you know, the details of, you know, what is the cache size, uh, how many stages of pipelines and all of that. Okay, why are you we are still going in the detail. No, my, my, my is Chrome there. is frozen now. Yeah. I cannot <laughs> shift between the documents. Maybe let, let's do this. It's kind of abrupt and, you know, sudden. Uh, but let me just uh, oh wait it it's back it's back okay. hey, i'll i'll try to conclude in, in in a minute or so yes please oh it was loading the pdf oh, and... let's close that man that is <laughs> just taking up like what <laughs> let's close that tab oh, close that tab okay done uh, cool uh yeah it's not it's not letting okay yeah <laughs> okay. cool man okay no problem no, i will just you know uh, you conclude, yeah. Yeah, the, can you open? Uh, there was, yeah, the, the first can't. step. Okay, you can't. I can't. Okay, Maybe now, now I, I can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now I can. Yes. Yeah, so this is where you would find, you know, info pertaining to that particular core we are talking about. So here, if you see the title itself says Cortex A53. And you, here you would have all the info about the details of how that, what that core implements. Uh, so this is this, this doc here, because it is not that big, it is, you know, scrollable in HTML. I can mm -hmm. also download on the top, uh, download yeah. button. And, you know, this is kind of the document that we were showing the diagrams, uh, from, I from. suppose, uh, that was maybe, programmers maybe not this, huh. yeah. maybe not this. Mm -hmm. okay. 
So yeah, right. this is so we have the covered PDF, proof, PDF, PDF then. Uh, it is what, like 623 pages, nice. Yeah, Not it was bad. something like that. Mm. Uh, okay. and... and the last one where, you know, this is where we will find most info uh, as a software developer. And it itself says programmer's guide. Mm -hmm. So it contains everything which a programmer should know uh, about whenever they are trying to write the software uh, for a class. Uh, yeah. And this is what we were showing when we are, you know, uh, describing or uh, briefly talking about the diagram, the exception level diagram. So this was the document open. And yeah. I also should mention, uh, by the way, I also noticed we are close to an hour. Mm -hmm. uh, let's wind it up in an hour. Um, so there is this download button where you can get like the PDF for all, right? Once you're on that screen. And so in total, there are three documents. One is the architecture reference manual that tells about definitions in the architecture. Then there is an implementation document based on the core that you're looking at. So Cortex A53 mm -hmm. is the implementation. So features of that, how many pipelines, this, that. And then the final one is the programmer's guide, which is like, okay, if you want to now program or you know use the ISA to do something, what are the different parts? What are, for example, you know, the registers mm. and how do you program those and so on and so forth. Yeah. That is available here. Okay. I think we are about an hour. Uh, do you want to conclude the call? Yeah. So okay. um, the summary of this, you know, one, one ish hour was we wanted to sort of hook you into the upcoming videos and basically provide a pathway starting from, hey, why do I even care? Why should I even care, right? And we should care because it is, it has taken the world out of, uh, you know, out by storm. Basically every phone has a class score. So that is one reason. And second reason is because it's, it is cool, believe me. Uh, once uh, once we peel all the onions, uh, you would, and my hope is that, you know, you'd feel it was worth it. Yeah, I think, you know, for an, embedded software engineer uh, i would say army class cores are like holy grail complex sort of, yeah. yeah core that you can deal with because it's used in cloud it's used in you know automobile even uh, and infotainment mm. unit and so on uh, it's used in laptops it's used in anything that essentially Computer. doesn't have an x86 <laughs> yeah. core but yeah. requires uh, applications to run on them most likely an army class CPU. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, also should, uh, we should also mention, so we have another series on M class CPUs. This one will be on the A class CPUs. And then the R class CPUs are like a hybrid of M and A. So if you know both A and M, uh, you kind of can figure out R. Right. Right. So that's the idea. Maybe in the next one, we'll be, uh, we'll be starting off with a more formal journey, right? Uh, and hopefully, you know, um, this was good enough an introduction to a class if people have questions you know feel free to put them in the comment section reach out to the discord server uh, or even linkedin <laughs> would would suggest discord um yeah and that's about it cool All right uh, do we want to call this a meeting then yes, yes yeah okay perfect thank you for joining in and staying thank, around thank you people i'll yeah. we'll see you in the next one bye bye yeah, yeah. bye bye